Well, hey there, guys. So I kind of have a different idea for today's show, and that is to basically uh, provide you with one of my webinars in podcast form. So it's kind of cool to uh, go through one of these. Uh, I'm doing it live, obviously, this is recorded, uh, but then you can listen to it. Uh, you can also go on to chirofarm.com uh, and go to Farm Media. And this one will be tagged as cross training for ownership and mobility, or just as the webinar is tagged. Um, so I'm going to cruise through this thing, and I'm not going to uh, adhere completely to the slides. But I'm also releasing this podcast because just as of yesterday, I released a new product on our website as well, where I am now going to be doing personalized cross training remotely or via online. Uh, for runners, and that's for the small price. I feel like an infomercial of only forty-four bucks a month. I think that's a steal to uh, basically get programming that's specific to runners. I'll be going off into other endurance sports, but coming from a fairly heavy trail running um, and sprint background, that's where I'm going to stick for right now. So if you're you're lost on what you should be doing outside of just your running, which uh, we're gonna talk about today, you should be doing something else. Uh, go check that out and I'll put links in the show notes. So let's dive into this. So when we say cross training for runners, this is typically what they think. And uh, again, if you're listening, go look at the slides. But basically we're showing a triathlon um, kind of picture here. So when I talk to a runner and I say, what are, you know, what are you getting done to cross train? It's uh, well, I'm cycling, you know, one day a week and I'm getting in the pool to offload. Those aren't bad things, but what we also have to be aware of is those are still what um, we term sagittal plane movements, right? So I'm still moving in the front to back plane. Um, they're all pretty much aerobic based, depending on how we're training, if we're doing short sprint intervals or not. Uh, but these are not taxing your system really in much of a different way, a little bit different. There's different moving components, um, in particular swimming and running, uh, to these. But there, there's no stressor to make my, my tissues, uh, my nervous system adapt in a different way, in particular to a sport or activity like running where I'm, uh, there's a lot of impact. There is a lot of repetitive movement. And we need to be able to vary our movement, which we're going to talk about quite a bit today, uh, to try to, A, increase my performance or improve my performance as best I can, limit injuries, um, which I may do a future uh, podcast slash webinar on injury limitation or prevention. Uh, but at the end of the day, you also become better at your sport just overall by varying your movement, just like I'm sure a lot of you have heard of the, the non-early specialization of youth athletics, right? If I start playing baseball at six, seven, eight years old, and that's all I played at high school, um, statistics and uh, research would show that I'm maybe not going to be quite as good as some of my uh, friends or peers that were a little more well-rounded in their athletic endeavors. So this is the, the classical or really the dictionary definitions of cross-training. Um, the action or practice, and I like the word practice, so I highlighted that here, of training or being trained in more than one role or skill. Also, the action or practice of engaging in two or more sports or types of exercises in order to improve fitness or performance in one, one's main sport. It's a pretty spot on definition. Um, I disagree with these definitions because if we read the second one and it says engaging in two or more sports or types of exercise. I agree with that sports. That's what a lot of our, our running community is doing is just engaging in other sports, but those sports are too closely mimicked or have too many of the same component parts as running. So here's my definition. Imposing demands upon the musculoskeletal, neurological, and psychological systems of the human organism in order to increase performance and limit injury. Uh, now that could also just be training right so when we say cross it just means different but i guess this would really be a definition of training and also updating hardware and loading new software so right i'm trying to 
uh, workout is literally breaking down the tissues of our body. So then I have to go through recovery and then I am a little bit better for it. I'm a little more robust. I'm a little stronger. Uh, the software part is how do I adapt to those different movements from a nervous system or neurologic standpoint? So why? We're kind of we've hit on this a couple times already. You know, why do I want to cross train? Uh, injury prevention, right? If I do the same thing, I think as runners, we, we've heard the, the old bill of chronic repetitive stress injury, um, you know, chronic repetitive stress syndromes, but uh, we're going to talk about basically adaptation loads. And there's a slide in here that is just, I think you really need to understand as an endurance athlete, and we'll get to that a little bit later. Um, and like we said, performance enhancement. I think it makes sense um, that to that if we get stronger, we become more efficient, we're gonna be better runners. But I know that there's somebody out there listening right now that has, and no, you know, I'm not knocking anybody. Maybe you're a somewhat novice, you've gotten into it, you got online, you found a 12 week training plan, you stuck to it, the 12 week training plan. Uh, it may not have cross training involved in it at all. And maybe it does. And the cross training is, you know, you do some planks, uh, you do your myrtles routine, uh, and maybe you swim and bite. Um, that ain't cutting it in my eyes. So before we dive into, you know, what is cross training? How do we do it? We have to talk about pain versus pathology. And what do we mean by that? Uh, basically, you can have pain without pathology you can have pain without something being torn or ruptured or bulged or broken you can also have pathology without pain right so i can have a um you know i can have a, up to even a fracture i can have a torn uh, rotator cuff which is very common i can have a multiple herniations or bulges in my my back and i have no pain that's why a, pain is such a mystery, and it's kind of fun in my world to get to treat something, even though sometimes it's frustrating. Uh, but for all of the, the medical advances and research that have come to light over the past maybe 200 years, I think we still know maybe, maybe I'm wrong, I think we know maybe 5% of what's really going on in the human body. And that may be a very low um, percentage, but for the amount of knowledge that comes out every day and the differing opinions and uh, basically just the, the, the multitudes of way practitioners like myself can treat the same complaint or the same injury or the same pain and get results just shows us that we're kind of lost when it comes to understanding the human body. So it's, under, it's, it's a very important note to think about uh, these differences in pain and pathology. What I'm also going to do is I'll put a PDF that I made kind of explaining how I analogize pain to my patients that gets them to understand that maybe, um, in particular with some of these chronic repetitive stress injuries, maybe I'm not dealing with something that's broken. Maybe I'm dealing with my, my nervous system or my body as an organism speaking to me through pain, which pain is communication, uh, to tell me to do something different, do less of something, uh, please give me some sort of different load. Uh, and I think when you start to change your mindset on, on that a little bit, it can really help uh, create leaps and bounds of a awareness of when am I dealing with injury versus when can I push through it? Uh, B, you know, if it is an injury, how do I rehab it appropriately? Like when can I push? Uh, and I'm not denying that there are not true injuries. Like if you have a stress fracture and you keep running on it, you're probably going to turn it into a fracture, right? Uh, but again, don't think that just because you have pain, something's broken or, you know, needs fix. So how do we, how do we create an injury? And this is not just an endurance sports or chronic or repetitive stress injuries. This is just overall. So here is a good slide to understand uh, the stress strain of injury and how I train. So if my capacity is less than the amount of work I'm doing, so that could mean my aerobic capacity, could be my, my tendons, my muscles, um, I could be dealing with an injury. Now, we have to get into this zone every once in a while in training um, to make bigger leaps and bounds. Those are our really hard days, right? Those are um, track workouts, tempo runs. These are three rep, you know, maxes. These are 
uh, high intensity tra uh, interval training sessions. But what we find is too many people are doing too much of this too often, right? So we're, we're that mortal sin of endurance sports. This is where we play most of the time with training, right? So capacity equals load. We're making enough uh, stress to then create a response um, and we need recovery to happen. When we play in the first one too much, we can do that. And if we do it smartly, you need what's called super compensation. I need enough time to recover where I can actually make positive adaptation. And that is far longer than we think it is. Research would show even beyond. So if I have DOMS or delayed onset muscle soreness, research would show two weeks past the last basically subjective sign of muscle soreness, you're still repairing muscular tissue because muscle is one of the fastest adapting tissues. So what's that mean? If I'm, you know, I did a really hard, like, let's say CrossFit workout and I'm, I'm feeling pretty good in two days. And I'm like, man, I'm going to go work out the same thing. You're probably still in the regenerative phase. And if we do all of these high intensity uh, training sessions or I'm, I'm, you know, outpacing my capacity and my running and I'm, you know, I should be running at 830 mile and I'm consistently hitting 730s. Um, we just know that we're taxing the system too much. And if you, you know, a lot of us have seen the book, uh, 80, 20, the, you know, 20% of my runs or training should be in that this capacity is less than load. Um, but if you, you tax that too much and we flip it the other way, we're dealing with injury. So now when capacity is greater than load, that's, that's truly injury prevention, right? This is creating a buffer system. This means that, um, I can do more work than I'm being stressed. Now, if this is what your training looks like, you're not going to make adaptation. Uh, if this is what your competition looks like, I don't think you're pushing hard enough. Your competition should be pretty much in this, this top one up here, uh, somewhat, uh, not all the way. But I think too many of us are guilty of falling into this last capacity greater than load. And I'm going to show you where the, our different tissues, where their capacity uh, uh, lies on a timeline, which is kind of eye-opening. So it's just kind of funny. Let's see if this plays. So this is me showing that it's not always a capacity or a load issue. Um, so that was me busting my butt hiking or running out in Oak Mountain. And sometimes you do have trauma, right? Sometimes we, we, we fall off a bike, we break a clavicle. Sometimes we uh, have a very awkward lift and we have a traumatic injury. Traumatic injuries are different than these chronic repetitive uh, training induced injuries. So we're, we're not talking about those today. We can't buffer for those. And those are the things when you get into contact sports like football, how do you limit injuries best? You basically make the, the human or the organism as resilient as you can um, in the best way possible. But this is, like I said, this is geared more toward endurance athletes. So I'm not really going to go into that methodology because it's a completely different uh, training and injury prevention modality or mindset. So adaptation. This is the word of the day for this podcast. Adaptation. And... I'm a big fan of the military mantra of adapt and overcome. So I can make an adaptation, but then I also have to apply that adaptation um, in basically an applicable manner to my training. Now, what does this chart mean? And this chart is what we're gonna spend some time on. So if we look at these first few lines here, the first one we can see is muscle. And on the left, we have basically, uh, tissue adaptation or basically we're looking at how the the cellular response or how are we regenerating or bolstering those tissues over time and then we have time in weeks and we go all the way out to 110 weeks right so we know there's 52 weeks in a year so we're basically a little two years and a couple weeks out on the end here so look at muscle so muscle falls right into when it peaks out on it's basically it's fully adapted, right? Uh, my training uh, is not going to now outweigh uh, capacity on my muscle. That happens fairly quick, right? Right in the range of about max is about, I don't know, 10 to 15 weeks. We know that in, say, I pick up a sport or I pick up, uh, 
you know, weightlifting. The first two weeks of improvement is completely neurologic. There's really very little to no physiologic change in the muscle or the cellular uh, part of the muscle itself. Um, beyond two weeks, that's where you start to make change. That's why your gains, right, with a Z, start to slow down a little bit. Uh, but then let's look at these other tissues, right? So we see that uh, bone is next on here, and it's peaking out about 35 weeks. Um, we see ligaments um, almost the same as bone. But look when we go out into tendons and cartilage, right? Tendons and cartilage aren't peaking out until that two-year mark. Now, what does this mean? This does not mean that you cannot run a marathon um, with, you know, six to eight months of training. What I'm telling you is, if you're a complete novice, say you started today and you had the goal today is we're September 6th and we say we're going to run um, a, a marathon in March, which would, that's a very common thing, right? We'll start training in fall, the, it cools down here in Alabama, so we're not just like turning into a pile of sweat as we go run. And I'm going to give myself adequate time I start my 12-week training cycle. Maybe I start ahead of time. I'm ahead of the game. I'm doing better than the rest. I'm going to at least hit that muscular adaptation window. And when we see injuries, we actually see very few muscular injuries, right? You may get a strain sprain every once in a while, but that's actually the rarity. If you think about what do most endurance athletes, in particular runners, deal with, you're going to see high on the list are these tissues that are far out on the adaptation window here on the right of cartilaginous and tendon injuries. If you think about tendinosis, tendinopathies, uh, meniscus issues, uh, disc issues, which is cartilage, um, ligaments, right? So, and then stress fractures even, right? Now, why is this? Because even if we don't break those three mortal sins of too much, too often, too fast uh, for a runner, by the time I've hit my, my typical, I'm using 12 weeks, because if you go Google a, a marathon plan, that's usually what it's going to be, maybe 18 at max. Um, so we're only four months into a cycle. That means that my muscle has probably adapted fairly well. My bone is barely there. My ligaments are barely there. So now I, when I go into that, that competition or I go into those last two weeks of my training plan where I really ramp up the volume, my tendons and uh, cartilage are just taking a beating because if I go back to that chart with our capacity load equation, what have I done? I've created a scenario where load is now much greater than capacity. I'm going to repeat it maybe for two weeks, take a tape a week, and then go really blast it. And then we wonder why runners have the highest prevalence of injury, or at least the amateur running field have the highest prevalence of injury out of any activity or sport in the U.S. It kind of makes sense. It also makes sense, and this is partly due to um, mitochondrial and aerobic changes that take place as we age. It's also why you see that endurance sports have uh, more uh, better athletes or you get more improvement the older I get. And you see, you know, typically, uh, in particular, like sports like Ironman, your best age group is really, you know, 30 to 40 years old, which that's not an age group. I'm saying that age range. Um, you get into running, it's, you know, 30 to 35, even though you're really fast people um, and you're shorter distances, usually you're younger, but you get into like high elite marathoners, usually um, they're a little bit, you know, 30 years above. Every once in a while, you know, you get Galen Ruff, you get these people that can be outliers, but you're, most of your true like higher volume endurance sport athletes, uh, elites are going to be a little up in age. And that's because A, um, we know it takes a long time to build a big aerobic base, right? Uh, again, research would show if I start aerobic based or endurance training as a kid, um, I'm going to do far better as an adult because I've had just a bigger window to create an aerobic base. But you've also allowed proper adaptation. And hopefully we've allowed proper adaptation through what's called periodization. And all that means is that I'm not just going linear, linearly through my training, right? I start at point A and I just consistently climb the ladder like that little, do you remember the, the? oh, I can't remember exactly what it was, like a little German yodeler on the prices, right? And he kind of climbed up the price ladder and he fell off the edge and win. Um, that's kind of what most of our training looks like. We just keep going, right? And we'll hit a race. We don't really take a ton of time off. We just get right back to it. Say, I want to use my fitness. I don't know how many times I've heard this. I want to use my fitness 
uh, I don't want to lose it. I want to go into another race. I want to start training again. That's not like if you look at an elite endurance athlete, an elite marathoner, there that is not at all what they're doing, right? They take uh, ample time off. They may be running, but they grossly or drastically reduce their volume and their effort and the intensity, right? So this chart is just this is key to understand of what's going on. But then you can, I know if you've dealt with an injury, say it's a stress fracture, repeated tendinopathy, uh, the deadly plantar fasciitis, which is, has been recategorized. I want to tell everybody here, it's been recategorized in our uh, diagnostic classification system as a fibromatosis. Why? No, I'm just, this is offshoot. Uh, instead of fasciitis, which would mean the fascia is inflamed, um, what we're looking or what research would show is by the time that we're actually dealing with um, pain significant enough to address it uh, in the plantar fascia, we've probably had enough irritation or nerve sensitization to actually cause some cellular uh, degeneration or death, a little apoptosis of the plantar fascia itself. And that's where your ptosis comes in, right? That I'm actually killing that tissue. Fibro would mean that, yeah, it is, it's the, the fibrocartilaginous structure of your plantar fascia that's actually being damaged. So instead of thinking your plantar fascia is inflamed, what we're getting to, um, or what we would see more often than not, by the time that your plantar fascia is bugging you enough to come into my office, um, you're, you're literally killing that thing because you're just outpacing capacity on that plantar fascia. Next slide. So this, this is my, I don't know, maybe I'll, I'll get famous for this. I probably won't, to be honest. Um, but this is how I think of injury, at least in the endurance world. Injury equals volume plus intensity over time, right? That's this whole capacity equation. Injury equals volume plus intensity over time. Like literally... It's going to get huge if you're watching this. I think we, sh we just need to learn about this. We should tweet about it if you're looking at the w webinar. But understanding this, and if we take this equation, you can, if you remember, if you go back to algebra, we can plug in our own components of our training cycle, and we can create almost our maybe a percentage risk for injury. So say I take this equation, and I have 12 weeks, so that's my time. Um, I can gauge intensity, right, by something like a, a perceived exertion rate. Um, so Tim Gabbett's work, uh, perceived exertion rate is what a lot of coaches use, myself included, for some of my online programming. Um, so on a scale of zero to 10, uh, every day we're going to get a little feedback. Um, and then we match that zero to 10 rating on, like, you know, how, how hard was that effort? And then you start to see, man, these three workouts were technically the same. They were the same pace. Uh, same length of time, same, you know, mileage, but I was a four here and I was an eight here. Well, if you see that repeating, what do we mean? Well, we may be outpacing capacity. So I could take those PER uh, percentages and I could take an overall, right? Um, let's say I had an average of a six. So my intensity six, and now my volume, just take your mileage. And this, we're taking whole training plans. So say over the course of my my mileage, you know, I had, I don't know, let's say five, 400 miles, something like that. And then I add that intensity, which let's say it's a seven. So then we got 407 divided by 12. And I'm not going to really do the math, but that would be my injury percentage in my mind. Right. So let's see if that pans out. It's just a, this isn't hard statistics. It's just something to think about to be like, man, that number's huge. Well, how could I reduce that number? I could up my time, right? That's going to shrink that fraction. Um, I could reduce my volume. I could reduce my intensity. These are all important factors here. America versus capacity. <laughs> what do I mean by this? Uh, basically, I just think overall, we are hardwired in our society to go too hard, too fast, too often. Uh, we want the, the quick fix. We want the magic pill. There's no magic pill to being a, uh, there's no, A, there's no injury-free endurance athlete. If you do something for too long, you're going to get hurt. Um, you can just limit or reduce the risk for injury as much as you can. And we've talked about how to do that at, at nauseum. But I think this is a cultural problem. This is the only reason I have this slide in here. Um, I think when you, you look at sports like gymnastics, very high injury rate. 
um, because of the demands of the sport are so high, but you see how early we start training people, which there's a lot to unpack with that. All I want to say is that gymnastics is a multivaried movement sport, but we, a big piece of gymnastics is conditioning, right? It's bolstering the system, building capacity. So I can do my best in my training because we demand so much from the body in a sport like gymnastics. So performance, why, how does cross training relate to performance? Obviously we're building strength, power, speed, energy system utilization. So if I'm always tapping into the same energy system, so I think a lot of runners are now keen on the fact that I want to try to become a better fat burner, right? A slow oxidizer. Um, uh, that's the energy system I want to tap into. That's why we may do things like uh, fasted workouts, like low level aerobic fasted workouts in the morning to tap into that uh, fat burning or slow oxidative system. If I'm always doing that though, I'm not utilizing my other energy systems, which means that let's say I need the kick at the end of the race. Let's say I want to switch gears um, in two months from marathon after that marathon, I go do a 5k. Well, when I can utilize these energy systems, that means that my body has better interplay between these energy systems. And if we talk about something called the central governor theory, which um, Timothy Noakes kind of coined, what that means is that a lot of our fatigue is perceived, right? So as I perceive fatigue, my body is shutting my body, or sorry, my nervous system, my brain is shutting my body down far before I am actually fatigued in order to save me from really getting injured. That's how we get a kick at the end of like a marathon, an ultra race, something where it looks like that person is just completely taxed. Lo and behold, they've got a little sprint at the end. It doesn't make sense if you're completely out of fuel, right? We don't have a reservoir tank um, like a, you know, I don't know, like an air, like a airplane. Um, but when I tap into these different energy systems, I can jump through them easier. Um, even though I want to make play in that slow oxidative uh, system the most, but you may start out your race a little faster than you should have. Right. And you're going to be in that, that glycolytic state and we're, you know, we're burning up some of our, our glucose and, um, and then I need to transfer. And then at the end, I may need to kick again. But what if your sport, let's say our endurance sport is obstacle racing, right? We know that I need a very fast lactate recovery. So I may not train like a marathoner, but that means my energy systems, I'm kind of dipping in and out of two different energy systems. Then I'm going to get into um, a fast, fast oxidative system when I get on like one of the obstacles that's strength based. So there's just some things to think about here of not saying, man, I'm a runner. I'm going to be a fat burner. That's the system I'm going to use. You still need all the systems. So we need to tap into each one of them a little bit to make sure we're not just becoming uh, basically over-specialized. Movement optimization. You can see this is highlighted if you're looking at the slides here. Why is this a big deal? So movement optimization is, is I do more of the same thing um, could be sitting, could be running, could be uh, could be air squats. Let's say that's all I do. For some reason, I just do Tabatas of air squats every day. My body will become, A, very efficient at that movement, but at the end of the day, my efficiencies will start to break me down because humans are asymmetrical and we're built to be asymmetrical. And if you, let's say I had a, a bearing in a, a wheel, and basically the bearing is what allows the tire to move around the axle. Um, and that bearing becomes a little misshapen, right? Or it's always been a little misshapen. And I go too long, eventually that tire is going to start to wobble. I'm going to burn out that bearing. There is not a human on earth that is symmetrical. There are some that are a little bit, you know, more symmetrical than others. And those may be our supermodels from a beauty standpoint and our, you know, our very high level, um, you know, just movement people because they do have better symmetry. Um, but that doesn't matter because most sports are also asymmetrical. If you think about any rotary sport, baseball, golf, um, if you think about even swimming, most people are not bilateral rotary breathers. We're going to have a side of dominance. All runners have a side of more um, contact time. So we have a, a long short, long short. If you really listen to somebody run, it's not an even keel. We spend a little more time on one side just because we have uh, optical, neurologic, stability differences side to side. We also have structural differences. So if I do the same movement over and over, I'm stressing the same tissues, I'm uh, basically grinding or grooving, 
uh, that same uh, structural asymmetry, you're eventually going to wear stuff out, right? So that's why if we, we change the plane of movement that we're operating in, right, when I cross train, so there's three planes of movement. So if you think about the frontal plane or the coronal plane, it's like your hey, right, if you're watching me. It's like the Kool-Aid man dance, right? So it's front to back. I cut myself uh, front to back. Sagittal, cut myself in half. So that means I'm moving front to back. That's what running is. Transverse plane, rotary, right? I'm rotating. Swimming, cycling, running, sagittal plane movements. So what should my cross training probably have a lot more of? Rotary, right? And side to side movements. What do most cross training plans for runners have in it? A ton of sagittal plane stuff, right? Just a boatload of lunges, single leg deadlifts, uh, bilateral squats, uh, planks. So even though we may be getting stronger, we're not challenging the, the body itself biomechanically and also neurologically to adapt to anything different. And I think this is a recipe for di disaster. We gotta watch this movement optimization grow so it just grows in your mind so you really get it. So this is just my way of saying, do you have permission? Is your, have you been granted permission by your body to do the thing you're about to ask it to do? And the only way that you know you have permission is training, right? And that's what a lot of people say, man, I don't feel like I'm ready. You don't have permission. But how do you know if you're ready? You, you adhere as best you can to A, that injury equation, but also the capacity load scenario. You know, did I spend 80% of my time playing in that, that, you know, barely taxing the system? I spent 20% of my time taxing the system a little heavier with appropriate recovery. Um, and then race day, I'm going to really outpace capacity. Um, or did I spend a lot of my time not even really challenging myself enough, right? It was just way too easy. I didn't, I didn't know how to push myself. I was always training by myself. I didn't have a coach. All those things come into play. And one of the other parts of this is, do you have permission comes down to mobility, flexibility, and really strength. So let's say I'm a runner. And let's just use one movement of running. Let's say I need adequate ankle dorsiflexion. I think most people know when your ankle think toes flexing towards your shin, that's dorsiflexion. Let's say I only have 10 degrees. Let's say it's just on one side. Let's say I had a bad ankle sprain a couple years ago. Really common complaint. And I've only got 10 degrees of dorsiflexion on that side. And let's say I have the, the, the norm, which the norm on average is about 30 degrees on the left. Well, I hope this makes sense to everybody that if I lack mobility or movement, whether it's from a tissue or a joint perspective or just a neurologic or neuromotor control um, in a joint, the rest of the joints or the entire rest of my body has to make up for the lack of that movement to accomplish the task. The better the athlete, the better the compensator, the, the more amateur, the more novice the athlete, the worse we're going to compensate. That's why I'd, I hate to say it, that's why you're not a good as an athlete. You're, your body, your nervous system is not as adept at moving around these asymmetries and um, biomechanical inefficiencies and structural differences as somebody else. And that's just why people are, you know, tend to be a little bit better, um, along with a lot of other things, grittiness and drive and motivations. But let's say my joints have to start making up for that. That means you do not have permission from your ankle to technically do running. So you're going to start to probably develop maybe knee pain, right? Because my knee has to maybe now flex more or I get more strain on my patellar tendon I may end up with hip pain so I'm going to have reduced uh impact or I'm not going to be able to reduce impact forces coming up the chain because I can't use my plantar fascia my Achilles as well to reduce that impact and create that windless effect so now I got hip or low back pain again something super common so you need to find out if you have permission and an easy way to do that is a get and get working with somebody that can assess your movement determine, hey, these are your biggest areas. These are your linchpins. Why don't you work on these? You know, let's uh, give you some mobility drills. Let's give you some strength and conditioning. It doesn't always have to be this mobility fix. It could be, hey, the way you train, your cross training and your mobility can be together for the most part. Now, sometimes let's, I'm going to use a specific example because I want to make sure everybody understands this. Let's say I'm going to program deadlifts for somebody, even if it's not super heavy. And that person cannot touch their toes, right? They, with their knees locked out without any bend, they cannot touch their toes. That means if I'm going to deadlift a barbell from the floor, every time I go to the floor, I am completely maxing or outpacing the capacity of my posterior chain or my hamstring. It's more than your hamstring, let's just say hamstring. 
So if I outpace that capacity and now I'm lifting weight, my nervous system is going to start to say, this is not great. This is beyond my capacity. I can't do this. How might it communicate that to you? Pain, right? It may uh, limit your power, right? That's a very common thing. If I'm maxed out my range of motion, if I'm if my elbow is fully extended, my bicep is not as strong as it could. But it's also if also my bicep is as short or my elbow is bent as far as it can, it's not as strong. Right in the middle, I'm good. Well, how do I get the middle to be bigger, the range of motion to be bigger? I improve those end range of motion, right? I improve my toe touch. I improve um, my thoracic spine extension. I improve my hip extension so that my middle ground is stronger and I'm also creating buffers on either side of that movement for injury prevention or injury limitation. Because if I'm always maxing out my joint or tissue range of motion, I can almost guarantee you're gonna end up with a problem even if it's not in that area. Very uh, often quoted uh, quote by Gray Cook, first move well, then move often. I know a lot of people disagree with this, uh, especially if we're just trying to get people to generally exercise. Don't take the quote out of context. He's not telling you not to move if you don't move perfect. He's saying if you move a lot and you move like shit, you're probably going to run into problems. And I hope that if you don't agree with that, I don't know if we're going to agree on a whole lot. Uh, Gray Cook also talks a lot about this uh, joint by joint approach. So this, I somewhat agree with, I think there are faults in this, but it's a good schema for the general public to understand. If you start at, let's say your foot, your foot is a generally um, stable, right? We can create a lot of force through your foot, your ankles mobile, your knees stable, your hips mobile, your low back stable. You can kind of work up through the body um, in this approach, and it's a very it makes it very protocolish for some people, and it's easy to follow. But if I think about it like this, just use the ankle example. If my ankle, which is supposed to be mobile, now becomes stable, it's stiff. My knee has to become more mobile. So now I'm asking my joint to do something it's not meant to do, or it's outpacing its capacity. Again, I think we beat this horse to death. You're going to run into problems. Um, in our clinic, uh, we use tests like the F FMS, the SFMA, uh, these types of things to basically look at just like big movements, gross motor patterns, see where the big chinks in your armor are. You don't have to get nitty gritty all the time, but also what I try to do with most people when we're doing uh, mobility injury prevention, cross training is see, hey, there may be faster ways to improve your toe touch rather than foam rolling the crap out of your hamstrings and just stretching right? It may be a stability issue. It may be a breathing issue. And that thing that we're working on, the breathing, the stability, the, the vestibular issue, the neurologic feedback, the afferent input, or my ability to have great input from my, my joints and my skin and my eyes, and my ears, may knock out multiple movement issues, right? So let's say I'm not very good at rotating my body through my thoracic spine. I'm not great at touching my toes. I can't balance on one leg. Well, if we improve, let's say we found out, man, your right hip sucks, right? There's like a little stability issue. It's not that great at accepting load. We improve that. All of those things could change. and We didn't just go after five things at once. And just like a runner wants to become more economical and efficient, that's what I want to do with people's cross training. These are those three planes of movement. We would need to play more in that transverse and coronal plane. Um, in my opinion, when we're working with endurance athletes, in particular runners, and cross training. Now this, this is just, I'm a nerd. If you don't know what this is, this is a Fibonacci spiral, if you're looking at the slides with me. Uh, this basically is, just shows up throughout our natural world in almost anything you do. Um, the reason I'm showing this, and I, let me see what my next slide is. Again, we have a little um, nautilus shell showing in nature. Um, with the Fibonacci spiral. But when we show this spiral and we go back to this transverse plane slide, as a runner, I think we get taught a lot of the times that we're not supposed to move our midsection. And this is kind of out of cross training, but I want you to think about this. We think, man, I'm supposed to have a solid core and I move my arms in a pendular fashion. My legs move in a pendular fashion. That's not how you run. That's not how you create a lot of force as a runner. That's not how you reduce impact forces through the rest of your body. We are creating a rotation through your spine, through your torso, through the tissues. There's rotation occurring 
between each arm, between each leg. Um, we are not this mechanical, pendular, angle, angular motion machine. There is rotation and torque occurring, and the way that you know this is 100% true and not just uh, speculative opinion on my part is if you look at the organization of your Achilles tendon. So this is interesting. If, as your Achilles tendon drops down from the bottom of your gastroc and your soleus, your calf, it rotates 180 degrees before it supplants into your heel or your calcaneus um, and then continues in your plantar fascia. Why does it do that? Because just like a spring coils, when we add rotational force or torque to a linear movement, we increase force production immensely, right? So if I have a rubber band, it's not as strong. If I coil two rubber bands together, a heck of a lot stronger. But if I just lay them side by side, if I have two rubber bands in sequence, they're not as strong as if I coil or spiral them because now I'm displaced. I know this gets a little technical and this gets into kind of physics. As I displace force on a spiral, I don't have as much stress strain on any one piece of that rubber band or tendon or tissue at one time. So now let's extrapolate that out to just a human or a runner. If I'm trying to keep my body in these stiff positions because my, my coach, my, my running coach, my form coach told me I just move my arms back and forth. Your legs are supposed to pump back and forth and I have none of this rotary force. Uh, you're going to be a, a poor force producer, a poor impact resistor, and I think your economy or efficiency goes down. That's my, that's my speculation on this spiral system. Um, this is a little plug. I'm having a class at my clinic on October 15th, um, 5.30 p.m., where I'm going to be talking about just a couple of these big components of the, this rotary movement that I think gets A, gets beaten up in our world, but also I think there's a lot of ways that we can train that um, in the gym. So this is a video, I'm not gonna play this, of me doing a polyp lunge. Um, if you're not familiar with the polyp press, uh, basically you hold a band or something that you're resisting, uh, the force of it trying to create some rotation in you while you move, usually in a different plane of that resistance. That's great because we do need to be able to resist force to create force, but I think we get caught up in this, again, like static, positional, I need to hold my body in a rigid position. You need to be able to create force and movement. Um, and if you look at any sport, there's very, there, I don't think there's any sport where I'm trying to keep everything stiff except maybe powerlifting or something like that where I, I'm moving extremely heavy loads for a very short amount of time where I'm trying to keep a certain area of my body extremely stiff while I move everything else. Usually there's a lot of components moving at once. And I think that's what more of our cross training should basically go to. So here's my challenge. Play more in this 80-20 range. This is a great book by Matt Fitzgerald, the 80-20 running. I think he just came out with 80-20 triathlon. Um, it's very easily digested material. Um, I, I don't agree with everything, but I think it's, a, it's great guidelines, right? And most of us flip the other way. And I tell people this all the time in my clinic. The reason that most people as runners go out too hard too often is we're not very self-aware of our limitations as a runner. So what do I mean by that? Excuse me, I'm going to grab some coffee. If I'm a runner in my a low aerobic pace, right, my conversational pace for a mile is eight minutes, let's say it's nine minutes. But let's say I go out and I have a certain time goal for my marathon, and that's how my, my online calculator and my coach is programming my paces, right? So I want to run a sub three marathon. Never done it before. So I have to reverse. I don't have to. This is how it usually happens. I reverse engineer my paces, my volume, my intensity, that equation we looked at way back when. I reverse engineer that off of my goal. Now, that's not all bad, but when I do that, what I have to first take into account is where am I at? And I think there's a big disconnect between where we're at, where we want to go, and how to get there appropriately with reducing injury and improving performance as best we can. So if I'm supposed to be running at my low aerobic pace, um, which is 80% of my stuff, 
around there. Not always just low aerobic threshold stuff. There can be some tempos and fartlets in that 80%. Um, and I'm always going a little bit faster. So I'm outpacing that capacity. Say it's only 7.30, right? What we know is you're actually not making as many positive adaptations, A, in your energy system utilization, right? That slow oxidative system. So you're tapping more into that, that kind of combo system where you're dipping a bit into glycolytic and slow oxidative. Um, I'm probably taxing my tissues and my running economy too much too often. And if I do that over the course of a 12 week training period, you're gonna run into problems. So this is where you can see that just like any good strength and conditioning program is periodized over time, right? We don't just have an immediate goal. We have these larger goals within goals, right? So we know, man, I need to improve this lift or my running time now, but I'm only going to go up to this ceiling so that in a year, I, I have a bigger capacity overall, but if you constantly run up against the red line, you're gonna get drugged back down below where you even started, right? You get injured, what do you do? You gotta take time off. And what's that do? It somewhat reduces your aerobic capacity, your strength, your endurance. So just, just hear me out. Be a little more clever, right? Be a little more analytical, be a lot more self-aware about how you go about training and creating goals and be self-aware about where you're at and where you're starting from. And that's not just how fast can I run today how long can I run? It should include how well can I move? How strong am I? What's my strength? Um, what is my capacity from, you know, just a, a movement capacity? What can I do that I'm going to need to do to swim, run, bike, uh, OCR, whatever it is? Like, do I have the, the bare bone components? Do I have permission? Then once you have permission, start building capacity, and that, in my mind, is cross-training. So Pareto's principle, that's the 80-20, right? So this is my little, this is a very, very basic uh, rudimentary protocol. Um, when I originally taught the seminar, this is what I was giving to the people. So 80% in low threshold running, so four days a week of running, and I was just showing people how to fit this in, because people think, I don't have time to cross-train, I'm already running so much, I work, I got kids. 20% should be speed work, tempo, fart licks, et cetera. That's one day a week. If you think about the, we're taking the bare bones percentage, right? Cross training one day a week, okay? Rest one day a week. This is the typical thing, okay? My training, I just call it native training. It's changed names a couple times. 80% low threshold running three days a week, right? 20% speed work, tempo, fart lick one to two days a week cross training one or two days a week. So we just added one day a week of cross training and reduced one day of that 80% low threshold stuff, which doesn't mean that in my cross training, I'm going into the CrossFit gym and going balls to the walls. I'm not doing high hit training. Um, these may be, you know, slow, um, high rest, uh, strength cycle things. It could just be movement competency stuff. It could be body weight stuff. But these are almost recovery days from endurance training, taxing a different energy system. So I'm not, again, loading that up um, and also improving everything we talked about, movement, efficiency, strength, um, all that. Rest one day a week. And you can see I've italicized, bolded and highlighted rest. Super important. If you're taxing the system appropriately, recovery and rest, recovery uh, tactics every day, right? A little bit of um, stretching, movement, self myofascial release, but that rest day is a rest day, right? It's uh, it doesn't mean sit on the couch all day, but that means we're not doing these other things. And I don't think very many people adhere to that, especially in a lot of the worlds I play in and um, ultra endurance athletes. It tends to just be crush as many miles as you can. Um, if you're not crushing miles, we're usually crushing an IPA. And I just think again, if you really have lofty goals or big leaps and bounds you're trying to make in your um you know if you're trying to maybe go from a 50k to a 50 mile or 100 mile you're trying to go sub three marathon you want to break you know 17 minutes in a 5k you have to get a little more specific so margin for error all right you can see there's a lot of math that i'm doing here so if you take this equation out you actually have a two percent margin of error which is great what's that mean i may hurt a little bit one day right? And this is over the course of a training cycle. 
um, 14 week training cycle, I may be able to take a couple of days off and still be okay. And knowing that that's built into my plan, because I also can't tell you how many people come into me and say, man, I'm injured. I don't think I can take those three days off. It's been proven time and time again. Again, my man, Greg Cook, um, what you think you will lose in aerobic capacity by taking time off, um, you will drastically improve overall movement efficiency by working on movement, reducing pain. Um, so don't think that taking a few days off out of your, your, your training regimen is going to kill your, your goal. Um, this is something that I'm still trying to work on, uh, a little book. Maybe we'll come out with this one day. Yeah, it didn't come out December 1st. So sorry about that, guys. Uh, a little quote I want to leave you with. Knowledge is only as powerful as the action it inspires. Um, that was by me. So we got a lot of tweetables. We got a little quotables. And I mean, that's the truth though, right? I can give you all this stuff. You don't have to put it in action, it doesn't matter. But also this is, I think, what pervades the system, right? There's a ton of stuff out there. There's free training plans. There's people telling you all this stuff. There's people like other people like me telling you stuff on podcasts and videos. All I can do is try to tell you as best I can from my clinical experience, my own um, athletic, you know, performances and experience, and also the, uh, the research, right? What does research show us, which we shouldn't directly or strictly adhere to that, but all of these things combined, what have I formulated from my perception is that all the things we talked about are very important, and maybe we can break some of the, the dogmas that are held um, in endurance sports and in particular running. Uh, again, we'll, we'll tweet there. <laughs> Um, I hope you guys enjoyed that. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. Hit me with a DM. Uh, if, you know, if something uh, lit a fire under your butt in terms of if you don't agree with it, you really like it, please you know, post something out there. Uh, as always, uh, we love feedback on the podcast, so go give us a five-star review. I'm not telling you to give five stars. Five stars is great. Um, on iTunes, uh, you know, write us a review. Tell me what you think about it so I can, uh, again, give some get some feedback, get some constructive criticism. Uh, again, thanks for joining me and I will see you guys next time.